Let us pray. Most gracious God, our prayer is that indeed you would create in us a clean heart. That you would restore unto each and every one of us the joy of our salvation that is found in you. God, you came living a life and suffering a death so that we might be free. We confess to you that there are times where we know the truth of that in our heart, but we still live lives that are enslaved and in bondage. God, this morning, open all of our hearts and our ears to experience the message of your truth spoken anew in each of our lives. In and of myself, I am unable to do what you call me to do, O Lord, and that is to share your word with your people. I pray that the words that come forth from my mouth are words that are spoken and formed by you. That whatever is spoken, Lord, that you would anoint it in such a fashion that it might challenge us where we need to be challenged, convict us where we need to be convicted, encourage us where we need to be encouraged, O Lord. But speak, for your servants are listening. And all of God's followers said, Amen. Well, good morning. This morning, we are kicking off our Lenten, sermon, ser, our Lenten sermon series, which is the last 24 hours that change the world. Over the next six weeks, we will trace each Sunday the successive events that Jesus encountered within that 24-hour time span. What we know is that Jesus lived 33, year, 33 years, which is approximately 12,000 days. Of those 12,000 days, the four gospel writers focus on approximately 1,100 of those days, which are the last three years of Jesus' life, all of which leads up to the last 24 hours where Jesus will gather in an upper room where he will deal and struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane, where, they, where he will be tried before the Sanhedrin, will go before Pontius Pilate, will end up being tortured, crucified, and died and buried. What all gospel writers knew, as well as believed, that what happens within these 24 hours is so powerful, is so transformative, that it has the ability to change the world forever. This morning, our 24 hours begins in the upper room. The setting is Thursday evening after sunset. And as scripture said, Jesus sent John and Peter before him to prepare the upper room. As the disciples gathered, as well as ascended to that upper room, it would have been customary that they removed their shoes. Now, they did not wear high heels but they would have worn sandals. And all day long, they would have walked through the mire, through the mud, through whatever else it is that they found on the streets of Jerusalem. And as they deposited their sandals, if the household had a servant, that servant would have met them at the door. And that servant's responsibility would have been to wash and to clean their feet as they entered. If the household did not have a servant, then they would find a basin and a pitcher of water that they were to clean their own feet. What we see on this night is that the disciples gather in the room and they are fully aware of the pitcher as well as the basin, except none of them stop to clean their feet. We don't know exactly why, but perhaps the idea is that if they were to stoop so low to clean their own feet, then maybe they would be expected to clean the feet of another. And they didn't want to have any part of that. And so as they gathered in the upper room, walking past the pitcher and the basin, the room would have looked very similar to this. This is a three-sided table that is referred to as a triclinium. Can you say that with me? Triclinium. Triclinium's are lower to the ground and what would happen is that each of the disciples would sit with their feet behind them. They would lean on their left arm as it was positioned on the low table, and they would eat with their right hand. This is the posture that each of the disciples would have taken that night as they prepared for what was to take place. 
Now, in order for us to make sense of why Jesus chose for this to be his Last Supper, we need to put it in its proper context. For this is the Passover Seder meal. And we have asked uh, a rabbi, senior rabbi, author Nimitoff, to share with us the meaning of Passover Seder, and particularly what it is that Jesus may have been trying to tell not only the disciples, but trying to tell us on this powerful night. Take a look. Passover Seder is, in essence, a play that's done in a home. We use a script, which is called the Haggadah, we have props, which are the symbols for Passover, and family and friends get together and they, they experience the, the tr uh, travel from Egypt into freedom, from slavery to freedom. It says in the Passover Haggadah, in the book, that we need to each feel as though we ourselves have gone from slavery to freedom. And we try to do that in story during the Passover Seder, the first night of Passover. The purpose is for each of us to feel and so we have left servitude. And the message of freedom is the essential message. So when Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, what Jesus is saying to, the, to his followers, you will be eating me as the sacrifice. And in eating me, I will become a part of you. And I will be that message of freedom and liberation that you will experience. Because both Jesus and his disciples knew about that message of freedom and liberation, which is the essential message of Passover. So the Passover Seder meal is a reenactment of the story from Jewish captivity to a movement to liberation and freedom. And it points back to the events that happen in Exodus chapter 1 through Exodus chapter 15. In order to summarize what those chapters uh, portray to us, what we know is that the Hebrew people were enslaved for Egypt for hundreds and hundreds of years. And as the demands upon them to produce bricks over and over the years became even more strenuous upon them, they began to cry out to God. God heard their cries. He raised up a leader by the name of Moses. And Moses went to Pharaoh nine times over, begging, pleading to let God's people go. Pharaoh said no. Until the night came in which God instructed Moses to get the people ready. Make haste, he said, for tonight is the night in which you will be delivered from slavery to captivity to freedom. And so he commanded each and every Hebrew household to take a lamb, to slaughter that lamb, to take the blood of the lamb and to paint the door frame in each of their homes. Well, what happened is that night, the angel of death would go throughout the land and every place he saw the doorpost, the doorframe, painted with the blood of the lamb, he would pass over that house. What we heard that night in scripture is that the angel of death killed the firstborn children of the Egyptians and all throughout the land there was deep anguish. There was wailing. In fact, the Hebrew people were instructed, if not begged, to leave Egypt. And so as they went from a position of captivity and slavery to that of freedom, God commanded that on the anniversary of this night, each and every year, that they are to reenact the story. And so even today, Jews will gather around a Seder meal in which the story is reenacted, where they will eat unleavened bread, signifying the haste in which they didn't have time even for the leaven to rise. They will eat bitter herbs, reminding themselves of the bitterness of slavery. They will also eat the salt water, reminding them of the tears that were shed during those many years of captivity. They'll drink wine, signifying the blood of the lamb. And once again, they will remember the liberation and freedom that God allowed them to have. This night of all nights, the night that Jesus chose to be his last supper, he extends a challenge to the disciples as well as us to experience a new kind of liberation, a new kind of freedom that is found in Christ and in Christ alone. As we think about this understanding of liberation and freedom, we might wonder what is it that the disciples were enslaved by? 
I mean, they were not the ones in captivity in Egypt. So what is it that they find themselves in bondage to? Well, we don't have to read the story long to find out that in a matter of moments at this Last Supper, a dispute arises among them where they begin to argue back and forth about which one of them is going to be the greatest. Now, I don't know about you and sometimes when you open and read God's Word, but sometimes I look at what the disciples do and I feel pretty good about myself. You ever feel that way? I mean, I I am struggling to get this Christian journey right, just right there alongside you, but at least I wouldn't be at the table with Jesus arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Or would I? Have any of you ever been in a room full of preachers? If you have, let me see your hands. If your hand is not raised, your life is better for it. Just so you know. Because at some point in the conversation, someone will say, tell me what church you serve. How many members do you have? How many people are on staff? How many worship services do you hold? How big is your budget? Do you know what they're disputing? Who among them is the greatest? The good news is for all of you is that this only happens to pastors. So y'all are good. (laughs) What we all know is that each and every one of us, since the very beginning of time with Adam and Eve, struggle with this issue of pride struggle with this issue of recognition, struggle with us being known, with us gathering more, with us climbing as well as knowing where we stand in the pecking order. We see that immediately, not only are the disciples gathered around this table, but that you and I are as well. You see, that night there was one person that seemed preoccupied. In fact, he seemed disengaged with the entire conversation that was going on at all. His name was Judas. Judas had, before the meal, gone to the chief priest and the religious leaders and said, tell me what you'll give me for Jesus. Tell me what you'll give me if I deliver Jesus to you when there aren't any crowds around. How much money, how much can you offer me for this man Jesus? And as the chief priest and the religious leaders look at what is unfolding before them, with joy and with glee in their hearts, they say, 30 shekels. We'll give you 30 shekels for Jesus' life. Without even hesitating, Judas says, sold. Tonight after the meal, I will deliver him to you in the garden. And what we miss in Scripture is that this price that was offered for Jesus... This 30 shekels is the same amount of money that they would have used to have purchased a slave. Here is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And what we see Judas enslaved to is this hunger for greed. This hunger for just a little bit more, even if it comes at sacrificing his own soul. We see in Scripture that John says that Judas was the treasurer of the bunch. And from time to time, he'd simply help himself to a little bit of money. And we see that he's enslaved to the temptation that is before him. That for 30 mere shekels, for the price and cost of a slave, that he would offer up the Messiah to those chief priests as the religious leaders. Now, when Jesus deals specifically with that which is enslaved around the table, and as we find ourselves at this very table, I want you to consider, what is it that you're enslaved to? What is it that has you bound and in bondage? What is it that the best that you can, when you try to to, um, throw off the shackles and change to live the life that God encouraged you to live, that you find yourself still bound. Because what we know is that the struggles that the disciples have are the struggles that we have as well. And Jesus does a couple of things to meet the disciples exactly where they are as he meets us here this morning. 
The first that he does is as the dispute continues around the table, Jesus silently stands up. And he walks over and he grabs the basin and the pitcher of water. And you can imagine that the conversation comes to an immediate hush. That as they look and they see Jesus holding the basin and the pitcher, that they dread what is about to happen. Because again, God's own son, God in flesh, is about to bend a knee and take the role and form of a servant and do the one thing that each and every one of them refused to do. And that was to serve the other. And so one by one, Jesus would kneel at the disciples' feet. And he would take his time, tenderly, carefully, washing and serving and cleaning each and every disciple. He would continue this all the way around the table until he arrived over here. We believe that Peter was sitting here. And in fact, the person that was sitting in this position was expected to serve all of the others because they could easily get up and navigate around the table. When Jesus comes over to Peter, who in all actuality should have been washing each and every one of their feet, Peter denies Jesus and says, Jesus, do not wash my feet. Until Jesus says, unless I wash your feet, you will have no part of me. To which Peter then says, by all means, don't even wash my feet, wash my head and my hands and all of me. We see that as Jesus bends the knee and becomes the servant to them all, I imagine his heart's breaking. He spent three years with these guys. He's poured everything he had into them. And on the nights, just hours before he'll be crucified, they still don't get it. They don't get it that to truly be great, you bend a knee. They don't get it that to live a life of greatness is more about blessing than it is being blessed. More about giving than it is receiving. It's more about us becoming low so that God can become great as God works in and through us. And he realized once again that that which he has given and poured into those that he has loved so much don't get the lesson and truth. That whether they're enslaved by their own pride, whether enslaved by the money or the greed that occupies them, they're unable to fully live in the direction of love that God compels them to live. The next thing that we see Jesus do is the way that he strategically positions each of the disciples around the table. Now, oftentimes when we think of the Last Supper, we think of da Vinci's painting, don't we? You're going to see it come up in just a moment. And if you're familiar with da, da Vinci's painting, just so you know, this is all wrong. In fact, there is little about this painting that is correct. What we know is that the Passover occurs after sunset. If you notice, it is light outside in this painting. Also, we know that Passover Seder is referred to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you look on the table, there is leavened bread. We've talked about the triclinium and that it being low to the ground. Da Vinci depicts the table as being high. We also see that Jesus is positioned in the center of the table. Well, he wouldn't have been positioned in the center of the table. In fact, the host of the dinner would have been positioned the second seat over from this end. In a moment, you'll see a seating chart come up. And Jesus would have been in this position, which is position one. In position two and in position three would have been those that Jesus was closest to. And when I say closest to, I mean emotionally close to. We believe that John the Beloved was here, but position two would have been a little bit closer than the person that was in position three to Jesus. 
For we know that position one would have served Jesus. But then the person in position three would have been served by the host himself. And so position three was the space that was believed to be for the highest of honor. That that was the position that everyone wanted to be in. We believe that Peter, again, was sitting right across from John. Because sometime in the dinner, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And Peter, if we read in Scripture, mouths to John, find out who it is. To which John reclines and leans back into Jesus' chest and says, which one of us, Lord, is going to betray you? And Jesus says, the one with whom I share the sop. Now, to share the sop is a great sign of affection. It is a sign of tremendous intimacy and friendship. And so Jesus turns and he shares the sop with who? Judas Iscariot. I don't know how you deal with people who betray you, who wound you, who stab you in the back. I know that in the past, I'll give them the silent treatment. I'll distance myself. I'll avoid them. But we see that Jesus offers us another way. For Jesus knows what Judas has already begun. And Jesus doesn't avoid them. Jesus doesn't offer the silent, silent treatment. But instead, Jesus puts Judas in the position of highest honor. And he says the only way that we can live lives of freedom is a life that is bound in love. In love. We hear the words that Martin Luther King speaks. On a Christmas Eve in 1967 at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And he says these words. Do to us what you will, and we will still love you. Throw us in jail, and we will still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children, and as difficult as it is, we will still love you. But be assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And one day we will win our freedom. And we will not only win our freedom for ourselves, but we will so appeal to your heart and to your conscience that we will win you in the process and our victory will be double. Jesus came to live a life that would ultimately lay down his life in love for you and me. That we see the life that is lived. That we see the suffering that he underwent. That our heart and our conscience is so appealed to that the victory becomes double. As we say, there is no other way that I choose nor wish to live that is to be free in Christ. Rabbi Nimtoff gives us a last look at what perhaps Jesus was doing as he offered a challenge to those disciples and the challenge that he offers to each and every one of us this day. Take a look. Jesus clearly in the Gospels was celebrating a Passover Seder. As such, he was very much a Jew and celebrating that, that message of freedom. That message of freedom is a universal one. It's not limited to Jews, it's not limited to Christians or Muslims, to blacks or to whites, it's, it's all humanity. So the message I would offer my Christian friends is that as you know about the story of Jesus, as you begin to read about the Last Supper, you read about uh, the crucifixion of Jesus and, and his resurrection, the message I hope that you will carry within your hearts is one of freedom. Freedom for yourself, freedom of faith, but also freedom, physical freedom, 
and emotional freedom and freedom from hunger and freedom from, from, from fear for all human beings. In a moment, each of you will come to the table and you will see a common substance of bread and of juice that Jesus takes, but it is a symbol of so much more. For just as the Seder meal was a reenactment of a liberation from bondage, every time we come to the table, it is a remembering of the sacrifice that Christ made for you and for me. And so if you find yourself this morning enslaved, if you find yourself wanting to live a life that God has called you to live, but you know you cannot live it without Christ by your side, then we invite you to throw off the chains. We invite you this morning to come and partake and receive of God's abundant grace and leave forever different because of it. The invitation has been extended. Christ has suffered for you. May you be forever changed for it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.